Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for coming. My name is Nancy Horowitz, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program on behalf of the Elie Wiesel Center for Jewish Studies and the minor in Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights Studies. We began this minor in order to offer our students a focused opportunity to study in depth some of the most crucial events in history and to learn about causes, consequences, and legacies of these histories. Studying the causes of genocide is essential. As an example, students learn about the impact of extreme nationalism and how racism and prejudice can be spread through the media. We also discuss international human rights laws as a way to combat genocide and other violations of human rights. In addition to the undergraduate minor, we offer a graduate certificate to students currently getting their graduate degrees in other fields. The talk that you're about to hear is part of our series, Encounters in Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights Studies. Our topic this year for the series is the politics of genocide. The event this evening is the second this academic year, and we have others planned for the rest of the spring semester, including David Tollerton on March 24th, speaking on Holocaust memory in Britain, and Mark Garrity on April 14th, speaking on genocide ideology in Rwanda. More information about these events will be forthcoming, but please mark your calendars. At this point, I would like to turn over the introductions for tonight's event to Dr. Sultan Dugan. Dr. Dugan is a postdoctoral associate at the Elie Wiesel Center, and she is the co-coordinator of the Encounter Speaker Series. Her research is concerned with the question of citizenship and religious minorities in Germany after the Holocaust. She is also interested in the topic of memorials and human rights after mass violence. I will now turn the introductions over to her. Thank you, Nancy. Um, welcome everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Melissa Bilal, uh, who is with us tonight. She's a social cultural anthropologist and historian specialized in music studies. She's currently distinguished research fellow at UCLA um, in the Center for Near East Studies and lecturer in the Department of Ethnomusicology. She previously taught at the University of Chicago, Columbia University, Bozic University, and the American University of Armenia. Dr. Bilal received her BA and MA in sociology at Bozic University. She earned her PhD in music, specifically ethnomusicology from the University of Chicago. She was a Mellon postdoctoral teaching fellow in music at Columbia University and postdoctoral research fellow at Orient Institute, Istanbul. So I will mention some of her recent publications because I think they're very interesting and related to what she will be presenting tonight. Um, one, one recent publication includes the article Lullabies and the Memory of Pain, Armenian Women's Remembrance of the Past in Turkey. And the CD project, Voice Imprints, Recordings of Russian-Armenian POWs in German Camps, 1916 to 1918. And she co-authored a volume in Turkish, My Heart is Like, the, like Those Ruined Houses, Gomidas Vartabet's Musical Legacy. Um, Dr. Melissa Bilal has been active also as a visiting scholar of history at MIT where she launched the annual Feminist Armenian Studies Workshop and co-founded the Feminist Armenian Research Collective with Dr. Lerna Ekmekjola. Ekmekjola and Bilal are also the co-editors of the book, A Cry for Justice, Five Armenian Feminist Writers from the Ottoman Empire to the Republic of Turkey. And they're collaborating together on feminism in Armenian, an interpretive anthology and digital archive, a book which is in progress for uh, Stanford University Press and Digital Humanities Project focusing on 12 Armenian feminist writers who are active in the Ottoman and post-Ottoman context and their diasporas. Dr. Bilal is also currently working on her monograph tentatively titled Wake Up Lullaby, Gendered Politics of Indigeneity, Music and Memory in the Late Ottoman Armenian Revolutionary Imagination and the ethnographic research project The Injuries of Reconciliation Being Armenian in Turkey. A warm welcome. We have also with us as our respondent and moderator who will lead through the Q&A, Dr. Uh, Professor Roberta Mikalev. 
She's a professor of the practice in the Department of World Languages and Literatures. She's also specialized in Middle Eastern literatures and women, gender, sec gender and sexuality studies. She's also the coordinator of the Turkish language program and her area of expertise is 19th and 20th century Ottoman and Turkish literature. Her current research interest is women's life writing. Most recent, recently, she has worked on translations of women's writing and contributed chapters to volumes on travel writing. I'm honored to have both of these stellar scholars with us tonight, and I wish everyone a pleasurable and interesting evening. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Sultan, for this kind introduction and for initiating the organization of this event. Thank you, uh, Nancy, Jeremy, and Khadija for inviting and hosting it, uh, inv inviting me and hosting this event. And many thanks also to Roberta for accepting to be the respondent um, to my paper. It is a really uh, exciting opportunity for me to be sharing my work at Boston University's Elie Wiesel um, Jewish Studies Center. Um, I would like to share my screen. Jeremy, could you uh, make me the co-host? Or Khadija? Thank you. Okay, can you see my screen now? I guess so. In August 2012, I visited Naze at her apartment in Kumkapa. She was born in Sasun in 1932 and moved to Istanbul in 1971. When I asked about the reasons for their migration, her daughter Dvartuhi explained that because her family's land was confiscated during Katliam, that is massacres, that is the Armenian genocide, they ended up working as sharecroppers in the field that formerly belonged to them, as well as other fields in order to make a living. Economic hardships and the fear caused by the harassments they faced as Armenians in their hometown forced the family to leave for Istanbul, a city with a larger Armenian community and functioning institutions. Naze was multilingual, fluent in Armenian, Kurdish, Arabic, and Turkish. She had grown up in an Armenian speaking home, but avoided publicly using her mother tongue in order to protect herself from the verbal attacks of the non-Armenian neighbors. She regretted that she couldn't properly teach her children how to speak Armenian. Her daughter added that back in the village, it was not only the mother tongue that they, they refrained from uh, using, but also the massacres they did not much talk about. When Vartuhi was detailing their lives back home, her explanations caused discomfort in her mother, who got upset for not having had the opportunity to share enough with her children. To respond to her daughter's comments, and as if wanting to come up with an explanation for her caution in passing the family, familial past onto the uh, younger generation, she said that she was under tremendous psychological pressure. But, but it turned out everything was safe kept in Nazet's memory. As I asked, she began storing her family's past. She opened her narrative by first referencing older women in her family as her, as her main source. Quote, my mother used to tell, my mother-in-law used to tell, unquote. She then started to tell what she heard from her mother and mother-in-law. While she was speaking about the horrific scenes her elders had to witness, such as the river running red because of the corpses thrown in the, into the water, she cried out, quote, I'm crying day and night for them. Young, beautiful girls, boys, youth, they killed them all. 
They threw them into the water. How can humans do such things? Uncle. When I asked Naze if she remembered any laments from all the women in her family, she responded that she forgot them all. But she remembered that listening to their laments and weeping, she felt the pain and cried more than they did. Naze occasionally stopped our conversation to sing a love, wedding, or revolutionary song in Armenian or Kurdish from the Sasunmush, that is the Armenian Daron region. During our conversation, Vartui was sitting next to her and completing her mother's narrative. She was turning to her and asking some details in Kurdish and explaining to me in Turkish. This way, I heard from them the story of an Ottoman soldier from nearby Mush who saved Naze's mother-in-law, her kids, and hundred other Armenians from burning alive. Naze's mother-in-law, her kids, and hundred uh, sorry, other Armenians from burning alive. I listened to the sacrifice Naze's sister-in-law had to make by marrying a Muslim man in order to prevent him from killing her family. They explained that abduction and rape were constant threats for Armenian women in the village. Vartui complained that Armenian families forced their daughters to marry at young ages to protect them from similar cases. With the early loss of her mother, Naze too was married off when she was 13. Remembering her youth, she deeply sighed. She was reminded of the physical and emotional distress she experienced as a child bride, raising 10 kids while working in the fields and watching men's laziness. Although she told me that she forgot many lullabies she used to know and sing to children, sing, sing to her children, she shared with me the lullaby she remembered from her grandmother. It was from the voice of a mother who worked in the field. Ruri ruri nstim hedorotsim sharjim zorot dgang kni yeskertam vaga ishi. Naze lullaby, her voice, her body, her expressions, her narration, all effectively conveyed a life world that was unknown to me. It conveyed the situated knowledge of being an Armenian woman in Turkey, born in the East, in a place that was once the heart of Armenians' native land. Like she often repeated during our conversation, Sasun Kabar Hin Hayastan, meaning the province of Sasun is ancient Armenia. A place that symbolized indigeneity, belonging, political consciousness, and resistance in Armenian collective memory. A place of which uniqueness has been commemorated and passed on by legends and songs. A place where she, as an Armenian, was born approximately a decade after the near total destruction of Armenian collective presence. A decade after the establishment of a new nation state, the Republic of Turkey, that appropriated the land and property from the annihilated and assimilated native populations and actively suppressed any possibility of holding the perpetrators accountable for this crime. The knowledge Naze accumulated as an Armenian born into a family that survived the genocide and managed to continue living in their hometown side by side with the actual perpetrators and the savers included a toolbox of everyday strategies of, to cope with the epistemology of denial and to survive an ordinary life which was hostile to their very survival. I opened my talk with Naze's story, a story of which public articulation remains criminalized in Turkey today. Successive governments in Turkey, institutions of state ideology, and the national historiographical historiographical net discourse have been denying this past. History in Turkey is constituted by silencing the historical presence of Armenians in the land territorialized by the Turkish nation states and by banning the manifestation of the fact that this presence was brought to an end by state-sponsored state, uh, mass violence. Since the early 2000s, I have been conducting interviews with the Armenian community of Istanbul within the Armenian community of Istanbul to understand the, understand the ways in which different generations related to the memory of the genocide and its denial. 
The main motivation of my ethnographic research is to unearth the unwritten histories of cohabitation, conflict, discrimination, dispossession, violence, and displacement that shaped my native community's experience of home. In my search for a proper grasp of memory and belonging, I pay special attention to the significant role music and especially songs play in the affective transmission of a communal experience and a sense of historicality. Among these songs, today I will focus on lullabies sung to me during my formal interviews in Istanbul with Armenian women of elderly generation born in different parts of Turkey during the earlier decades of the Republic. As Nazir's example shows us, this generation did not only experience the effects of the aftermath of the genocide on the surviving Armenian population in Turkey, but also endured the new nation state's hostile policies against its non-Muslim citizens, now quote unquote recognized by the Lausanne Treaty as minorities, namely Armenians, Jews, and Greeks, and Assyrians, who were outside the official category, but not exempt from oppression. During my interviews with them, I witnessed both the desire to give voice to memories and the choice of remaining silent due to fear or discomfort in remembrance. Today, I will introduce you to two other Armenian women from Istanbul and share their songs and narratives of the past, which I read as deserves of memory. They are parts of everyday performances of remembrance of loss and survival. They take active part in the formation of historical knowledge at the affective, that is bodily and instantaneous level, and against the background of denial and the consequent politics of manipulating the public sentiment toward anti-Armenianness in Turkey, this knowledge, this affective knowledge for local Armenians in Turkey stands at the constitutive core of what we can conceptualize as double consciousness. In August 2011, I visited Yevchanik in Kurtuluş. She was born in Istanbul in 1922, approximately a year before the declaration of the Republic. Her mother was a deportee from Kurtbelen, the only survivor from her family, of which 50 members she had lost during the genocide. Yerchani called her mother Chartigin, a woman of massacres, a woman who survived the massacres. She was 19 and married when she was deported. Yerchani related to me that her mother used to say that first Armenian men were taken to the mountains and most probably instantly murdered. Soon after, on the Memorial Day, that is Merelot, the Monday of Bartavar, the Feast of Transfiguration, her mother was deported with other women. Quote, she used to say that she went near the Euphrates River a couple of times to throw herself into the water. She couldn't and came back, said Yerchanik and added, quote, she was left alone. Yerchanik expressed the pain caused by thinking about the fact that her mother had lost all her loved ones and out of desperation wanted to kill herself. Quote, we are going, that is marching, with my mother, she says. We are going, she says. Suddenly I realized that my mother too was not with me anymore, she says. Where did they go from my side? What have they done? Ah, 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 I suffered a lot, says my mother, suffered a lot. I was left alone, she said, unquote. Yerchanik's mother must have survived the death march from Kurtbelen in the Northwest to the Southeast towards the Arab provinces of the empire. Yerchanik related that her mother owed her survival to the fact that she ended up with an Arab family and spent the war years taking care of their children. She did not provide any details about the conditions under which she ended up with this family or under what conditions she served them. Many others, she added, who continued their march, went to their Zorf, went to places I don't know, because there was chart massacres everywhere in Anatolia, says the Archonic. 
When the war ended, Yerchanik continued, a woman and a man came to the house where her mother worked and asked if there were any Armenian girls there. The family lied to these people, who probably were relief workers collecting Armenian women and children survivors from Muslim, that is Turkish, Kurdish, and Bedouin households. Overhearing the conversation, though, Yerchanik's mother was able to sneak out and let them know that she was Armenian. A few days later, she took refuge in a shelter where other Armenians were gathered. With the help of her aunt, who sent money for her escape, disguised as a Muslim woman with the name Fatma, she made her way to Istanbul. Her aunt had arranged a marriage for her with her husband's nephew, a survivor from Armadan, which is present day Armutlu and in Erzincan, Turkey, who had also recently joined the family in Istanbul. Yerchanik said that when this younger man, who later became her father, met her mother for the first time and questioned her to find out about the conditions of her survival. In Yerchanik's words, quote, now apparently they heard many things such as immorality or those kinds of things. My mother said, all beautiful girls. She said, gendarmes. She said, all of them, soldiers, they make proposals. They each take one girl to save their lives. My mother said, they told me to. Makri, don't do this, don't resist. Come, you take one, that is one of these men, two, and save your life. No, she says, I'm going to go to Istanbul and then go abroad. She had this in mind. I will go to Istanbul and then go abroad. She speaks with my father. No, she says, there were proposals, but I rejected them, she says, unquote. Yerchanik's father must have witnessed or heard that Armenian women in deportation caravans had been subject to rape, abduction, and forced marriages with Muslim men. Yerchanik probably wanted to assure that her mother did not owe her survival to a marriage or had not been a sex slave in the house she worked. However, it was not uncommon that survivor women kept silent about sexual violence they endured. During my interview with Yerchanik, I learned that her mother never gave up on looking for the family members she lost on the deportation march. She posted her search in Armenian newspapers in Lebanon and the United States with the hope of receiving a response. She also had a diary that she started keeping on her way to Istanbul. She refused to give this record of her ordeal to anyone. Yerchanik told the story of the fire that destroyed their home and her mother noticing that her diary was left inside the burning house, throwing herself into the flames to save the notebook right before the building collapsed. Yerchanik defined this as her mother's second survival. She also said that her relatives, fearing that it could put them in danger, asked Yerchanik not to mention this diary to anyone. When I asked Yerchanik if her mother shared her memories with her children, she responded, yes, we know the entire story. She used to tell the entire story. Poor woman talked about nothing but this. She used to cry and tell. She used to get depressed. My mother was nervous, but she was a wonderful mother. She raised us really well in every sense, unquote. While communicating the challenge of having a survivor mother, and knowing how much she suffered, Yerchanik shared with me that hearing or reading stories similar to her mother's made her cry. She had grown up with a difficult truth and carried it in her body throughout her life. During her conversation, I sensed how her mother's story was also her story, a part of her own self. She related to the world with this truth. She made sense of the world through this truth. She confronted the world with this truth. When I asked her if she knew any lullabies, she whispered these lines. She tried to remember the rest, stopped and said, wait, let me find my songbook. She got up and walked towards the drove her to find the songbook her mother used to sing songs from. While walking, 
she told me that her mother was a very knowledgeable woman. She had attended the local school in her village. She used to read a lot and knew history well. Yerchanik learned everything from her. According to Yerchanik, her mother was one history. In December 2010, I visited Hripsime in Kurtulus. May those days go away and never come back, she sighed when I asked her about the genocide. She was born in Sivas in 1932 and moved to Istanbul in 1979. While growing up, she had heard from the elderly that many Armenians in her parents' native Tavra village, a few kilometers outside the city of Sivas, were spared from deportation because there were millers among them who could supply bread to the Ottoman army when needed. Her father was a contractor who had graduated from one of the local Armenian schools in Sivas. To my inquiry about the school's current condition, Hrivsime responded, quote, do you think they, meaning Turkish and Turkish authorities, are stupid enough to let it remain? Unquote. And as a response to my question about the church, the condition of the church, she noted, quote, there were churches in Sivas. I was not very old when they tore one of them down. My mother and father cried. My father had friends who are all dead now. On a Sunday, our doorbell rang. We invited them all in. Welcome, welcome. He, that is one of them, said, tomorrow, he said, our wives will go to clean the chick clean the church. They, Turkish authorities, will return it back to us. It, meaning a church, was in the marketplace. My father responded, what kind of stupid people are you? Do you really think that they will ever give it back? Unquote. Hrivsime went on telling that the church had been in use as an arsenal and guarded by two men with bayonets. Her father, who was deeply surprised at his friend's naivety, later had to witness the destruction of the church. In the middle of the night, he woke Ripsime's mother up. Sofik, he said, Yegeretin Pletin, Urin, Urin Pletin. They destroyed the church. They finally did it. They destroyed it, he said. Ripsime added, Then we all cried. Remembering that event, he called another image in her memory, quote, there was a monastery, all marble behind the wires. There was something, something like woods, green area. Standing next to it, my father used to hold us and point to Astiga da Jarne. This is the church. This is the place of birth. And I actually saw the uh, church, and this is a, this is from the website of International Hunting Foundation, um, and. The, the photographs are the present day uh, photographs condition of, of these two churches that she's talking about. And uh, one of them, the monastery is within the borders of a uh, um, military um, zone in, in, Tavra, in what was Tavra village before. Peripsime grew up in an Armenian speaking house, but could not learn how to read in her mother tongue because when her two younger siblings were sent to a private tutor of Armenian, she had to stay behind with her mother to help take care of the house chores, which also prevented her from completing her primary education. Although both of her parents were literate in Armenian, because of their heavy workload, they preferred to send their kids to this tutor who was originally from Merzifon in Amasya, and during our conversation, Hribsima affirmed that despite her lack of formal education in Armenian, thanks to her insatiable curiosity and ability to learn by ear, she picked up many songs and ditties in Armenian from her mother and grandmother and passed them on to her own children and grandchildren. Quote, I have curiosity, my daughter, addressing me. I always want to transmit what I know. This is our thing. Our traditions and customs should not be forgotten, unquote. Mm -hmm. 
Sen kaldın ki derden yadigar. Buyur yavrum ninni diyeyim sana. You just heard Philip Simmel's voice singing Uyu yavrum ninni diyeyim sana. Şu mahzun kalbimi salma hicrana. Sen kaldın gidenden yadigar. Uyu yavrum ninni diyeyim sana. This lullaby in Turkish was about a father who was gone or taken away. Revisiting this interview years later, I regretted that I could not ask her why she chose to sing this lullaby to me and who this father was. I contacted her family to see if they had any information on the lullaby, but Hripsime had already passed away. And her daughter, who was with us during the interview, could not remember the details. I remember very well how Hripsime's sudden switch from this lullaby in Turkish to a commonly known lullaby in Armenian with a theme of motherly love had left me puzzled and made me conclude that it was too painful for her to talk about the former one. Nevertheless, she wanted to share it with me. Instead of interrupting the moment of silence created by her quavering voice, I must have unconsciously preferred to share the silence. In this research, where I was both the researcher and the community member, addressed as my daughter or my child, there were many such shared moments, regardless if I had previously known the interviewee or not. During my doctoral and postdoctoral research, I talked to many other women and men of Nazes, Yerchaniks, and Hripsimes generation. I learned that survivors who continued living in part, various parts of Turkey either secretly talked about the violence they witnessed or preferred never to mention them to anyone. In either case, as I try to demonstrate today, their children grew up having a sense of their parents' stories. Women who were born outside of Istanbul told me that in their everyday lives, alongside the ruins of formerly functioning schools and churches, last remaining Armenians in their hometowns turned those ruins into sacred sites, both as reminders of what happened to their community and as places of worship. Those who were born in Istanbul, on the other hand, told me that their families who migrated to Istanbul from the interior forbade their children to go and see where they escaped from. For many Armenians today, their or their parents and grandparents' hometown, like myself, Though within the borders of the same country, their country of citizenship, is not a place safe enough to return. By bringing the voices of the members of my native community in this talk and in my overall broader work, I aim to challenge the definition of minority that does not problematize the very process of minoritization, disempowerment, and dispossession. As you have seen, the stories and songs I shared with you today all mark Istanbul as both home and a place of displacement. They also point to both continuity and rupture in Armenian life in Turkey. That is both to loss and to survival and to survival with tremendous losses. The lullabies and other songs Armenian women and men sing in Istanbul today accumulate and carry the marks of lived experiences on their bodies. With the variations in their lyrics and melodies, with the various dialects of lost homes and lost communities these songs transmit through their bodies, bodies of the song, they shape a memory. They continue to exist, to be present in everyday conversations or interviews like mine, to remind and to resist forgetfulness. They, have, they, they create, they established affective bridges, emotional bridges, bodily bridges between generations in my community whose language and history and the very existence is under the surveillance of the state. When injuries of the past are not worked through, they suffocate the present. As we heard in these accounts, the emotions evoked by painful memories of historical injustices expressed with the words, I cry day and night, or I'm burning now, 
or the anger and despair in the face of enormity of the atrocity and the shamelessness of its denial are st statements to assure that the memory is very much alive and causing pain in the present. My job is to make them heard as protest against any stance vis-a-vis -vis history that fails to acknowledge the damage its silencing causes in present day social relations. In Turkey, the denial of the genocide legitimizes hatred towards the Armenians. Besides any discourse that fashions a specific definition of reconciliation or forgiveness, forgiveness to celebrate a domesticated, docile memory and to stigmatize other modes of remembrance and emotions further silences the formative violence that the nation state was founded on. Affect created and transmitted during storytelling, singing or silence and the feelings of pain, grief, longing, despair, fear, fear, anger, resentment, protection, endurance, courage, or gratitude evoked in the moments of connecting with the past constitute a mode of knowing. To this knowledge, to this mode of knowing, I attribute the capacity to point to the original silence that repeats itself every time history and culture are repeated in Turkey are represented in Turkey. Hence, I argue that the stories and lullabies I shared today store and distribute senses that bring the listener into an intimate relationship with a certain kind of truth and its repeated violation by denialism. And by this capacity, I believe they have the power to inform our orientation to the past, to disrupt this epistemology of denial that we are surrounded with to decolonize history and to guide us to a more genuine conceptualization of social justice. Thank you. Thank you. If you have, oh, yes. I'm... <laughs> no, that's all right. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Um, I have a few comments to make and then I have a couple of questions and then I'm sure that the uh, audience, who I cannot see but I know is there, has many questions also. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Um, you really um, brought up a lot of interesting thoughts. Um, I immediately connected what you were talking about to the importance of stories, the power of stories um, in opposition to official history. I'm thinking of Fethiye Çetin's book, My Grandmother's Story, that wonderful, powerful post-memoir of what happened to her grandmother. And the line about may those days be gone and not come back, of course, is also in that book, as her grandmother dis I mean, tells her that she's one of these Armenian children who survived and was married into a Muslim family. And the power of that book to get people to talk about the genocide and what happened um, tells us how powerful these stories are. But it also, I mean, all the work you're doing is so important because it's writing women back into history. These voices that don't always appear in official histories. Um, and while, especially in military contexts, we hear a lot about women as mothers and their reproductive roles, we don't often hear about the transmission of information from mother to daughter in particular. We hear a lot about mothers and sons, and it's assumed that daughters get married and go off and there's no connection between mothers and daughters. But how beautiful this transmission, not just from mother to daughter, but also back from daughter to mother. We have this circle where one is informing the other and then being informed again. Um, but also I work with language and I love looking at language and looking at the text of the lullabies was fascinating because the text themselves, the words themselves, embed the stories of sort of going from one side of the country to the other, acquiring the Turkish accusative case at some point, um, sort of mingling Armenian and Turkish, singing something fully Turkish with an Armenian melody. I mean, simply looking at what happened to language and music tells a story in and of itself of migration, transportation, transformation over time. 
And of course, I couldn't help but think of Lernike McJola's work in terms of when you were talking about the um, woman who was being questioned about whether she was sexually pure or not, marriageable or not, the double jeopardy pay, um, that women in war zones face because simply because they are women and that they are both scrutinized by the power that is doing damage to their community, but also their own community is looking at them to see if they can uphold the values and the morals of the community. So there was, there you gave us so much to think about. Thank you for this rich talk. But I have a couple of questions. Um, you yourself said that you were treated as both a researcher and a community member. I mean, how did you negotiate that difference? How difficult it must have been to be an objective observer and information gatherer when you're at the same time being treated as a daughter of the family or a sister of the family? That's one question. And then my other question, um, I worked on prison narratives and when I shared this work with others, a question I often got was, how can you deal with this material? How can you sleep at night when you read this material? So I'm going to ask you the same. You're dealing with deeply traumatic materials. How do you, how do you manage the information? So. Thank you, Roberta. I mean, I couldn't have wished a better respondent because your work, I mean, your life experience, your knowledge as a woman, uh, as a scholar is so much in like, I, I'm, in my mind, I'm in conversation with um, your work and um, all the questions, all the points that you raise are so like relevant to how I'm, my, the, the lines that I'm thinking. Um, it's very interesting uh, when you mention women's uh, voices, bringing back, unearthing women's voices. And I know that you are uh, doing the same thing. Um, Sultan and I earlier um, were talking about my other research. Um, I'm, I'm writing a book with Lernaik Mekciolo on, I, we have a book in Turkish. Now we are writing a, a, a larger volume in, in English uh, on the history of Armenian feminism. So, um, I was actually keeping this to the Q&A also because I, this is going to be a conversation with you and also because I promised Sultan that I was going to, I want to bring up um, this point that a part, uh, I talked about the schools and the churches and these women uh, living side by side alongside the ruins of these uh, institutions, former Armenian institutions. Some of these institutions were girls schools founded by Armenian feminists. So my uh, kind of like life trajectory, academic scholarly trajectory, um, probably like I walked uh, down two paths. One is music, gender music memory and the other path is the history of Armenian feminist movement. And they are nicely coming together now because like they, these are, uh, members of the same community. So I was looking at the, their uh, written uh, texts that they pro produced, feminist women. And I'm, I was also collecting stories from uh, the, like orally transmitted stories. So when I bring the written and oral together, which are obviously not mutually exclusive, I uh, am actually, this is an opportunity because this work that I presented today is, was my, doctoral research and postdoctoral research, but something that I'm revisiting. And this, I, I, I'm really grateful that um, this event is giving me an opportunity to basically go back to my uh, oral history research, my research on uh, oral transmission of memory and songs in light of my new research on Armenian feminist uh, history, history of uh, writing. So basically, what I wanted to, to, to um, say is that in the geography that these women came from, uh, starting in 1879, up until the, until the genocide, Armenian feminists in Istanbul, through the societies that they founded, uh, were able to 
found 50 girls schools, okay. 50 girls schools in remote villages of uh, what is today Southeast uh, Turkey and East Turkey and uh, places that my interviewees actually were born after the establishment of the Republic and after the destruction of these um, churches and communities. So basically layers and layers of uh, women's stories and for feminist historianship. And the more I become um, kind of feel more expert in the history of Armenian feminism, the more I can connect it with um, these oral accounts that I collected for my lullaby research to see how they are actually like in, in uh, should be understood in relation to each other that these women could have gone if, if they stayed in their hometowns and if the geno genocide didn't happen, they probably could have uh, attended one of these girls' schools, become writers, uh, go abroad, become teachers, and probably like become, I'm not saying that these women are themselves already powerful powerhouses and they are passing on information. And as you said, they're not, they not passive transmitter of culture as the discourse says, and they're like, they are, they are the gatekeepers of uh, a community's history and memory, the unwritten. But now I, I'm seeing more and more how uh, they took up, they basically took up the baton, I want to say, from their feminist uh, older sisters, who were uh, writers and activists who started schools for them in, in the provinces and then everything was destroyed with the genocide. And these women that I introduced, they were born a, a, a deca decade uh, after the destruction and this is their life story. So I'm slowly trying to bring everything together to understand the community's history and the enormity of loss from uh, also uh, as feminists, the loss that we feminists of Turkey, of the world experience, because um, as you as you say, said, um, I think we cannot write the history of Armenian, uh, write the history of women in Turkey without uh, working to do this past, working to do the destruction of Armenian feminism and the experiences of Armenian women during and immediate aftermath of the genocide and the, gener the generation, the women who heard these stories uh, from their mothers and grandmothers and on their bodies, they um, took that burden of a knowledge, a memory that was quite like dangerous uh, to pass on or articulate in the new context, in the new political context. And they made decisions, big decisions of how to, whether to or not transmit it. Basically that this generation, the, the reason why I decided to work um, with this generation, the children of the survivors is that I believe that they are so, um, central, so important, their voices, their silences are the constitutive um, silences and voices of my community, the way we know ourselves. And connected to, to connect it to your other question, because these, their voices and silences are so like constitutive and shaping the strategy of my community of to talk or not talk or keep silent or voice out, uh, obviously, during the interviews, that was there was a level of even if I never met um, them before, there was a level of shared, um, I want to say, shared silence, and um, that's why I wanted to bring up that example of Ripsime. That I one I was young. The other thing is like when you are a PhD student and when this is emotional, but at the same time you have you have to write something. Um, you don't have the freedom. You don't feel the free. I, I didn't feel the freedom that I feel now because now I embarked on a new ethnographic research and I feel like I can ask questions and I can you know follow up on my questions. And there's also this uh, frustration of being a PhD student that. Uh, and also not knowing, as you, as you said, not 
uh, being able to man manage the affect really because that's uh, that that affect that this is created between me and the interviewee during the interview. Um, maybe I was not strong enough. Uh, and I was, uh, as a researcher, I, I actually like pulled my hair a lot after um, writing my dissertation, trying to publish articles out of the dissertation research until I came today, like even like yesterday, I was like, you know, I, this research could have been better if I had the strength and knowledge that I have today, but I'm looking back and I am being very autobiographical now. That's why your question is uh, so precious because now I am uh, approaching my own work as an uh, autoethnography, that why I didn't ask certain questions, what kind of things I assumed and what does it tell uh, about like being an Armenian woman um, born and raised in Istanbul? Uh, what kind of things were um, too painful to ask? Uh, so I am, it's a process, the, your question about like how I am dealing with it, it's a process uh, and it becomes uh, painful of course at times when history repeats itself. I if also like with the, the history of feminism uh, work and the, the music work that I'm doing, the memory transmission work that I'm doing, uh their 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 words resonate and sometimes it's um sometimes it make me, it makes me so hopeless about the future but sometimes i go back and they empower me uh basically so that's i think um i'll i'll leave it here so thank you very much Oh, thank you so much. I mean, I have lots of other questions. However, there are questions showing up. So we should take a look at what the audience is asking. Would you like me to read the questions to you? Or do you want to read them? They're both in the chat and in the Q&A. Okay, I see one uh, on the chat in your research. Have you heard any similar? That's the first one, right? Yeah, and then there are three in the Q&A. Okay, uh, uh, let me read this one. I'm wondering what it is. I'm wondering what Um, yeah, I mean, I do, I teach ethnomusicology, I studied ethnomusicology and I teach ethnomusicology. So um, I actually teach music and politics, music and um, trauma and witnessing. So uh, I have to say that music is, has been a very important um, medium, uh, a tool for expression of um, witnessing and trauma. Uh, I, yeah, I, I can talk uh, more about this, uh, but I, I, I will just say, um, yes, I mean, it's not obviously unique to Armenians, but uh, in my research, I didn't talk about the lullaby part that much today, but um, I studied the history of the Armenian lullabies, how in the mid 19th uh, century and up until the genocide and after the genocide, uh, their Armenian composers and poets uh, created a repertoire of lullaby songs to express, uh, again, like all these ideas of, uh, of like gendered constructions of, of uh, the, the Armenian peoples, past and the future. So there is a lot uh, to say about the relationship Armenians um, created between symbolic uh, meaning attributed a lullaby and it's in my dissertation and my article actually my historical research is more about where this uh, how this history was created how this like uh, close connotation and symbolic symbolic value was attributed to the lullabies uh, in in the Armenian uh, music history in an interesting way I mean not surprisingly uh, one example is uh, obviously slave mothers lullabies um, or 
Um, I can give you a couple of examples from um, Roberta. We love this. Probably, I'm sure you know it. Ladino lullabies. There are Ladino lullabies where um, Jewish women are, were talking about their pain and their uh, traumas and um, passing on these um, basically like lullabies as, as women's um, sacred diaries, uh, secret, sorry, secret diaries uh, that pass on things that are not um, necessarily written or even um, safe to talk about or write about. And, and language is very important, obviously. Um, and I, I specifically also like going back to Roberta's um, point and, and, and research expertise um, and to connect to this question, I obviously don't argue that Armenian lullabies are um, the only or uh, the um, medium through which the media through which genocide memory is transmitted. On the contrary, uh, sometimes genocide memory is not even transmitted, it's silence. But I look at uh, lullabies, some lullabies, uh, composed lullabies, or uh, not even composed lullabies, um, just um, orally transmitted lullabies talk about um, the experience of the genocide or the massacres before. Uh, but some don't, but even when they don't, they remind, the language reminds, the, the dialects that are carried across on the bodies of these songs remind that there was a community there, there was a language there that, that is lost today. So that's um, also something that I uh, write a lot about, the importance of language. So, um, we need to read out loud the questions because everyone else cannot see them. Only we can see them. Oh, the uh, question was uh, like a comparison if there are any other cultures who have experienced genocide and music, um, and what we can learn about the similarities and differences of experience of intergenerational trauma across cultural groups. I didn't study intergenerational. Uh, trauma so uh, but I can say that obviously I mean in any around the world unfortunately we live in a world there where there's uh, racism uh, homophobia and all like class discrimination economic uh, violence so uh, historical injustices injustices present injustices they're obviously uh, causing trauma and the trauma is um, uh, transmitted and uh, Art is a very important um, form of expression. So um, thank you for this wonderful, rich, and powerful work. I'm fascinated by your pursuit of uh, Armenian women's narratives of genocide through the lens of the lullaby. I wonder if you might share how you came to focus on the lullaby in particular. What was the first moment in your research process that opened this up as a space of inquiry? Thank you very much, Sarah, for this question. It was not even research, it was my grandmother. Uh, when I was growing up, she used to sing me lullabies. Um, and uh, basically, my initial focus was not lullabies, but I, uh, because I was, a, I was working with feminist methodologies and I was, uh, I was interested in feminist histories, basically, and in, theoretically, I uh, started looking at the transmission of emotions um, and the intimate, intimate transmission between women. And then uh, immediately my grandmother's uh, voice um, and her lullaby came to my mind and I started working. And obviously lullabies, uh, I taught and I read uh, that, I, I read other uh, accounts about how, you know, lullabies were uh, women's songs, basically. Uh, the other thing is, in my work, I criticize the genre categorization of lullaby. I actually show that it's a historical uh, and uh, a, a patriarchal construct because the, the it's a folklore construct that a lullaby is a lullaby who says so. And uh, if how are we going to? Uh, divide uh, the categorize the genres is it uh, to, is it a song that uh, we put children to sleep is it a song that talks about this and that so I am basically uh, criticizing the the genre identity 
justification because and I show historically that it's uh, it's not uh, the definition is not coming from the context and performance it's coming from um, a, a patriarchal understanding of women are at home and their mothers and they are singing lullabies and men are out in the fields and they're blah, blah, uh, in the in a rural setting which is obviously not the case like women were also working in the factories and um in the fields uh and hopefully more men will be singing lullabies to their children so uh i agree with tanya's comment by the way um, i don't think your research um I'll let you read it Oh, I disagree that the research could have been better. It is even research when black scholars research their histories. We do not expect them to be totally objective either. Oh, it's I was not talking about being objective. I uh, I mean, being a feminist uh, scholar and very well uh, know Donna Haraway, my Donna Haraway, well, the situated knowledge and, and all my work is about situated knowledges. So I'm uh, the 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 reason why I can see the value and power uh, and the capacity of knowledge production in these women's narratives is because of uh, feminist scholarship like Donna Haraway's uh, situated knowledge and that totally destroys this dichotomy of objectivity and subjectivity. So basically, uh, I, I was not talking about objectivity, I was basically talking about research methods because I teach oral history and I teach research methods and I want my students to ask more questions. I was really talking about when you're um, intellectually younger, I have to say, and when you're dealing with, uh, and it's not only in, in this case, it's not only because I'm from the community. Uh, you, you, I mean, it takes time to mature uh, scholarly and to ask the questions, to have the, uh, kind of boldness to ask certain questions. Uh, but, I, but I agree that I, I am now in this maturity of scholarship. I'm looking back to myself too. And I really like that it's also autoethnographic because I started collecting stories uh, literally when I was 20 years old uh, in, when I was at Boston University. And the body of ethnographic um, kind of data I have now, when I look back, I can also like historicize that those ethnographic moments from uh, when I started collecting these uh, narratives, Surantink was uh, not murdered yet. So, I mean, all the like traumas and traumas um, accumulated on my community. I, it's always, I love revisiting the ethnographies because people's, um, I love seeing how ethnographic moments become history uh, uh, of my own community, basically. Um, yeah, and I'm being from the community, basically, I, uh, I think I have, it gives me power, it empowers me and I value, and I methodologically uh, kind of want to think more and write more about being a native. Uh, native scholar, native anthropologist, native ethnographer, that um, the, the, the methodological openings it, um, it gives you uh, as, a, as a native, um, bringing in the native voices to the discussion on anthropology, because I have a lot of problem with anthropological knowledge production on my community, uh, obviously. So one of the major reasons why I'm working on emotions and expression of emotion and unexpressed emotions, the, the, the shared affect. And I believe that as an army who was born and raised in this community, my body as a female body, uh, as a woman's body, my interaction with these other women have a lot to do with like having um, born and raised in the same community. So there is an effective communication that is going on that comes from being a part of from part of the same community. I mean, I don't have to explain um, more here, but like there, there's a lot of research on native um, critique to like anthropology and decolonizing methodologies and everything. So I want to bring in um, that discussion into my work to do this uh, focus on emotions and affect, the shared um, emotional affect. Um, 
So where I am today in Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh, it is often said that girl babies are not valued because they are regarded as primary requiring a waste of resources. I suppose that the culture value devalues women as well. Does your wonderful research bump up against this attitude at all? And if so, what has been your experience? Um, I mean, this is not very related to my uh, research, uh, but I understand the question. Uh, I have been in touch and active with Armenia's uh, feminist movement. And as everywhere in the world, in Armenia as well, uh, there is sexism, there is homophobia, there is patriarchy, and there is also a very strong feminist movement that is fighting against that. Um, uh, in my research, you came across, I mean, I, I didn't necessarily um, deconstruct them or uh, refer to them from a like, frame, feminist critique perspective, but uh, I deliberately on purpose put these parts in my narrative where it's obvious that these women uh, were born and raised in patriarch uh, in a community in a society that is uh, organized along patriarchal lines economically socially and politically so the life choices the life uh, not even choices the life um, their lives were shaped by decision made uh, on their behalf um, their marriages their uh, you know uh, labor and their their schooling and everything uh, but I want to say that this is also a post-genocide condition because the reason why I opened the, the Q&A remarks with the feminist um, movement that was destroyed during the genocide is because to be able to juxtapose uh, the narratives and basically to answer this question probably uh, uh, a bit uh, earlier that uh, for me it's very painful to imagine what could have happened uh, had these this Armenian feminist movement uh, survived in Turkey and uh, what kind of like the effects of war, state violence and genocide to this day is basically affecting Armenian uh, Armenian communities understandings of gender relations. So um, we have about three minutes left. We could perhaps take one more question. We have a couple in the chat. So I don't know if you want to take a look at the chat. Um, okay. so, I think David Blair's question is the first one. Okay. I wonder whether Jewish mothers or Cambodian mothers or Rwanda mothers have sung similar lullabies or whether there is similar something different in our main culture and experience that gave birth to this way of remembering and as a father saying, well, what's the my children? Uh, that's very nice. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure. I mean, uh, if, as I said, my approach to lullabies as an ethnomusicologist is very critical. I'm critical of the, the, um, the genre identification. So if you have a kid to put to sleep and if you are singing to this kid, uh then you are basically singing a lullaby you're either it's it's the context of performance for me that defines what a lullaby is if you want to like give a name to the genre so that song can be something that you heard from your parents grandparents or maybe uh you you are ne not raised by parents or grandparents or whoever raised you or uh whatever you heard growing up or you're like, uh, whatever you're listening at that moment, whatever you want to sing and give. So that's a very, uh, that's a context of performance that is open to improvisation. And because it's open to improvisation, it's very much open to creativity. And it's a song cycle. You never uh, sing just one song. You have to sing a couple of songs to put the child to sleep. So basically that, um, that context of creativity is uh, free. And you can improvise, and basically, as every improvisation, it's not totally free. You have to base yourself your improvisation on something, and that something is a, a, for me. It's a repertoire, a repertoire of culture, a repertoire of uh, musical memory, 
whatever you want to express at that moment. And we come, we see that in everywhere in the world in different uh, contexts, politics, uh, trauma, love, desire, passion, everything, the human condition gets um, expressed and transmitted in the lullabies. The, the main point is I disagree with this is in my basically my dissertation was about this my i disagree with the definition of folkloristic this is old school folkloristic this is definitions of lullabies are simple songs that mothers sing to their children and it's like also a bit like um, not a bit quite sexist that like it's like they are not sophisticated they are not political women are but then uh we look at the lullaby texts when we look at this like variety of songs uh, people sing, women basically sing to their kids, uh, are actually very political. Uh, not only political in the sense that they talk about uh, war or uh, political events or, or political dissent or resistance, but also like um, in and of themselves in this case, what makes the questions of the Armenian lullabies uh, specific in this case for me in this context is that one, the fact that it's in a language that is uh, kind of under the surveillance of, of the nation state, you're singing in a language that is, uh, you know, that the state is really not happy that you are transmitting and, and keeping it alive and singing keeps that language alive. Uh, two, you're, you're singing, uh, about you're singing a song that you brought from a homeland that is destroyed. And every time you sing the, the memories evoke are detrimental memories. And also uh, in the repertoire, there are songs that are specifically talking about the genocide experience. The ones that were uh, composed for stage performance and then like turned into folk song or like, turned into like everyday performances, but also like songs that are uh, about one specific woman's uh, experience um, during, during the genocide or uh, one specific woman's experience, not during the genocide, but um, uh, another traumatic uh, experience of her life. I'm just gonna jump in here. Um, thank you so much, Melissa, for a really wonderful and very rich talk. That was really amazing. And I want to point out to you that you have some, uh, you have a fan club going on in the chat. So you should read some of the comments because they're really just lovely, the comments that are there. Uh, and thank you, Roberta, for that wonderful response. It really um, was great. It, it kind of opened up the parameters and really pulled us all in, I think, in very specific ways. So thank you for that, especially reflecting your work on um, studying uh, how women's lives are written that uh, and and the empower of stories that was really quite uh, quite something so thank you thank you both of you.